Alrighty. Let's have a little fun with the magic of counting today. So when we do a thing, when we consider what we're doing with what the effect is going to have, how do we plan out the numerical arrangement of what it is we're looking to do? So we all know that the numbers 1 through 9, 0 through 9, as they loop back around, they just add extra things to them. And so I had the opportunity to basically uncover a math problem that was able to calculate the 64 hexagrams of the I Ching and their Yang and Yin equivalents. That was an accident. But so let's say, for example, we have our one. Can you see that? One, one of us, a one effect, right? In this arrangement, it's just us and the effect. So this makes two. OK? There's two things that are going on in this arrangement of one to one. There's what we're doing and what our outcome is. Now, when we start including spirits, so there's us, what we're doing, the ingredients that we're using, and the spirit that we're using creates three. All right? Us. The spirit that we're using, the ingredients, and the gate that we've created. Right? And so the one that's the self and the two that becomes the heaven principle, right? So this is the principle of heaven. This is the principle of Saturn because it provides transformation. This is the principle of Jupiter and so on. So the more ingredients that we add to our spellcraft, the more planetary arrangements we conjure out. So as we consider out the, the ramifications of are we doing a one-to-one -one exploration? Am I doing a one-to-group? Am I doing a one-to-many? What are the ingredients that I need to express in a one-to-many situation? Right? What do I need to do as far as do I need to open the gates? Do I need to have a stone? Do I need to have an herb? Do I need to have an animal component? Do I need to have something that's a tool that holds it all together? The more ingredients that I use, the more applications of the numerical principles and the same kind of inflection of ingredient and property that those things are responsible for gets included in the spell that I'm creating. So that through these creations, I'm able to engage in the numerical principles a lot easier. So when you go through and you use things like the, the, the magic squares in the Arabic numerology, you can go through and you can figure out, okay, well, line one is supposed to be this number. Line two is supposed to be this number. Line three, and they should match. Line one should be this number. Line one down should be this number. Line two should be this number. Line two across should be this number, right? So you find the patterns of each within each. And once you do that, you can make those numerical squares into physical concepts. You can take math off the paper and make it more tangible, right? So it's like with hermetic theory, okay? And I say theory because it's, it, well, in this case, it's hermetic law, but it's a different way to approach the hermetic law. So this is how I do it, right? We start with the thing that we know we are is the dot. We have this space where the dot is not the dot. It's the God principle, where we are not, right? What is the thing that connects us to the God principle? And then what are the arrangements around that that we can then go back to? And then what happens when those arrangements meet to what we are? And then from that, we create our ritual array. So our journey into these different states, as they relate back to who we are, how we work, what operations that we have, gives us the ability to create sacred geometric patterns through action. We're able to employ these techniques. We're able to develop these techniques so that way we actually walk the grid of life. We are creating the journey of that individual through a fixed space. We are containing the space within it, but we are giving that space 
a fixed property. So that way, as we work the dot, as we create outward from that moment, we then have a foundation on top of which to build out not just how many paths that we have to include via the numbers, but what transformation is applied, what application of that grid then becomes a living principle of action that we express through our principle of life so that the combination of the vibration of who we are and the particles of what we do and all of that as it comes together and expresses our unity, we express sacred geometry. We are, in effect, creating this kind of geometric understanding of the living embodiment of what it is to be in the hermetic principles, to understand that we are a singularity within a collective so that as the thing that'll connect me to this other part of the singularity to connect to a greater part of the collective allows me to understand and walk within these different arrangements so that way I can serve better, I can work better, I can create more. So that as I open up the gates in this direction or in that direction, it creates a pattern of flow, a bridge, an archway through which the various things above create the temple space. So that by the creation of that temple space, we are not only walking the physical pattern of space-time, we are compressing reality to that moment of operations. So I hope this explains a little bit more about why I use arrays and the numbers and the math to be able to create the environment in which the spell is established, not just because it's numerically pleasing, but because each of these are representative of a journey that the individual takes as it divides from itself to something else from itself to the ingredients to something else, from itself to the ingredients to the inclusion of other things into, into the many. So as the, as the eight trigrams, right, the, the three different variations of the fixed line, the broken line, and the tri line, as it moves through the four constituents of the ghost, the heaven, the earth, and the human principle, right? So we're able to speak to and work in these different capacities. So as we open the gates and we control which portion of the dimensional space we're walking into, which quality we are applying in these natures, in these behaviors, that we are able to express ourselves in a much more vibrant way when it comes to our ritual work, when it comes to the math and the magic that we put out into the world so that way we are in control of our manifestation so that way we don't have to worry that it's going to go to shit. We know that it will work. We just don't know what it's going to do to the person on the other side of that. Because where they're at in their life, in their dimensional space, if they're not matched up to this pattern, if they're not able to walk in unity with this, then it becomes disastrous. Then it becomes where does the coaching need to be? Where does the mentorship need to help them through those difficulties in their journey so that way they are not left alone? So that way our students, our clients, our friends in the art have resources available to them that they can say, okay, well, this is the thing that I'm working on. I'm connecting to this energy and the singularity over here. What's going to be the pathway that I use to create that, that linking point? And from that, what opening spell do I need? What ingredients are a part of that opening? What's the return of that energy to this planet? What's the return of that energy when it compresses from far off in space into the moment of ritual space so that you've created a compression, you've created time, you've created the duration period of the spell, so you're tinkering around with the gravity of the situation, right? And by gravity, you're creating the entrainment, you're creating the effect. So. I hope this helps explain a little bit about walking through the sacred geometry and as you entrain yourself to these ideas where you are the, the singularity in existence and you're working more towards working with others in the singularity so that by your mutual compression you can create stronger bonds and by stronger bonds your magic manifests better and so your relationship to other energies relates better. So anyway.